Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new series, Mike Plays RP1. For those that don't know, RP1 stands for Realistic Progression 1, which is not a mod, but rather a large collection of mods that changes almost everything about the game, making it, as the name suggests, more realistic. The very first change you may be noticing is that that isn't Kerbin rotating below our Kerbals, it is Earth. Indeed, the entire solar system has been changed over to a full-scale version of our own solar system. Also, the tech tree and parts have been completely overhauled to more accurately reflect real-world rockets, while contracts have been changed to reflect real life more accurately as well. And that is only the beginning. There is way too much to go over in just this one video, and besides, we all just want to get into building and flying rockets with a minimum of preamble. That said, I want this series to not just be about my failures and successes, but also serve as an introduction and tutorial for those people interested in giving RP1 a go. So let's briefly talk about setup. I'm playing with KSP version 1.12.3, which is the recommended version. The entire list of mods is down there in the description, but attempting to hunt down and install those mods individually is almost guaranteed to end in frustration and wasted time. Instead, first install the mod manager CCAN, then use it to install Realistic Progression 1 Express Install and let it do all the work for you. If you need a hand with using CCAN, then check out the video here. I also installed a few additional personal favorite mods, again full list in the description, and I'll talk about those as they come up in the game. My game is on the normal difficulty with both require signal for control and plasma blackouts toggled on. Also, in the game settings, I made sure to toggle on advanced tweakables, extended burn indicator, and ghosted navigation markers, though the last of those three is purely an aesthetic choice. Right off the bat, we have a couple of intimidating windows staring us in the face. At the bottom left here, we have KOS, that is Kerbal Operating System. This is one of the mods I added on. It's not part of RP1, so I'm just going to skip past it for now and talk about it in a future episode. But it does make me select a connectivity manager. I always choose the ComNet connectivity manager, and we'll move on to this center Glorious window. This window is actually great. This is the space center setup and definitely read through this as it guides you through a lot of the initial setup for RP1. But in the interest of brevity, I'm just going to click understood and speed through some of the more essential things you need to know. Starting off with this fourth resource that has been added to the game. This is your confidence level, and it says here that confidence is a currency used to unlock faster versions of programs. It is earned by completing optional contracts and by gaining science. Activating a program at a speed faster than normal will consume confidence. And what are programs, you might ask? To find out, we need to go into the administrative building. The admin building has been completely overhauled, and it is here you select your programs. At the start, we have three programs available, X-Plane Research, Early Rocket Development, and Suborbital Research. We'll check out the first one here and see what this is all about. It says, this program tasks the space agency with the development of experimental aircraft to test aerodynamic behaviors at velocities and altitudes previously unreachable by crewed craft. So instead of sending Kerbals into space pretty much right away, you are going to have to start with jet and rocket planes. If you look over the objectives, you'll see they're all about breaking crude speed and altitude records, culminating with crossing the Kármán line and going into space. Note here it says, slots taken two. You have a max of five program slots available right now. This will take up two of those slots, and by the way, all three of these take up two slots, meaning you are limited to activating only two of these programs at this time. To complete the programs, you need to polish off these objectives. To help you out, you will receive 720000 in funds spread out over a period of nine years. That funding will end on January 1st, 1960. And if that seems like a long time, then you haven't met the mod Kerbal construction time yet. More on that later. 
Getting to the confidence, accepting this program requires 300 confidence. I currently have 500, so I could begin this if I want. Down here we see the annual funding for the program, which is also put into this nice graph for us. Now if you are nervous about this and don't want to spend so much confidence, you can select normal. This costs zero confidence and now the funding is spread out over 13 and a half years instead of 9. Still the same amount of total funding though. But if you are feeling really confident, you can go for breakneck. This costs 600 confidence, which is more confidence than I have, so I can't activate it anyway. But now the deadline is under 7 years before the funding will peter out. All three of these programs work in the same way, so I'll spend less time going over the other two. Early Rocket Development – The first step in developing orbital capable rockets. This program requires progressively developing suborbital rockets with increased capabilities. Here we're focusing on uncrewed rockets, basically you're building ICBMs. Then we have Suborbital Research. The goal of peaceful space exploration starts here, with rocketry missions that perform key experiments such as taking higher altitude photos and testing how biological creatures handle brief exposures to space and the rigors of rocket travel. You'll need to research the early science mode to complete this program. This is your sciency one and I'm going to grab it. I'll keep it on fast, that seems to be the default, and spend 150 of my confidence to activate this program. And I can grab one more. I'm much more a rocket guy than a plane guy, so I'm going to activate early rocket development for my second program. And with that, we're done with the administrative building. Let's go into mission control and pick our first contracts. Now the contracts are affected by the programs you activated. Under RP1 here, I have only two contracts available, both under suborbital rocket development. We've got first launch where we need a vessel to achieve a rate of climb of 50 meters per second and to reach an altitude of at least a kilometer. I'll grab that and, although I'm not going to do it today, I'm also going to grab Carmen Line. This is getting into space which means achieving the real life Carmen Line of an altitude of 100 kilometers. Notice under rewards we will earn reputation but also 10 applicants to our program as well as unlocking a bunch of leaders. More on applicants in a little bit, more on leaders in a future episode. Now there is other setup still to do before our first launch, I'll get to that a little later in the video, but we now have enough to do a build so let's dive into the VAB and get that started. Two more very quick things before we get started. First, many of you may have noticed I skipped the very first thing on the Space Center setup window, and that is to go to the tracking station where you can select where your Space Center is going to be located. The default location is Cape Canaveral, Florida. I plan to leave it there, but if you'd rather Brownsville, Texas, or Russia's Balkanor, or anything else, all you have to do is select it. Be aware though that launching from different latitudes provides different challenges. Second, although I have many years of KSP under my belt, I am still an RP1 rookie and there is lots here for me to learn. If you have suggestions or advice, don't hesitate to leave that down in the comments, but if you are ready to begin this journey with me, let's get started. I'll start by looking at engines because there is already a rather dizzying array of possibilities, but I'm going to pick the simplest, the Aerobee. Let's select it temporarily and right click to bring up the context menu where we'll find a button to show the engine GUI. There is a lot of information here but don't worry, it's not as bad as it looks. The engine is currently configured for the WAC Corporal. There are two other configurations, but they don't become available until we've unlocked the appropriate node on the tech tree. I'm showing you this because the WAC Corporal is a historical rocket, first launched in 1944. Because these engine specs are historically accurate, not to mention a more accurate aerodynamic model and having a real scale earth below us, you can get a good start on your builds by replicating the design of the original and that is pretty much what I'm going to do. This integration window is coming from Kerbal Construction Time, more on that later but I'm just going to close it for now. Rockets at this stage are made of three main components, avionics, propellant tanks, and an engine. For avionics, select avionics, not the probe core that's beside it. 
Notice there is a one-time entry cost of one ker buck that we need to pay to use this thing. This is a procedural part. Right clicking on it brings up again a lot of information. We'll get to that soon, but in the context menu you can see how you can change the diameter, the length and even the shape of this part. More on all this in a bit. For a propellant tank, there are some confusing options, but you will want to go with the procedural tank. Once again, pay the entry cost and put that underneath the avionics. This is another procedural part. Don't worry about the shape for now, we'll be able to change it to what we need later. Then under the tank goes our Aero B rocket engine. Let's bring up the engine GUI once again as there are some important engine details we need to make note of. First, it has a rated burn time of 47 seconds. Now it will likely go a few seconds beyond that, but providing more fuel than it will burn in this amount of time is clearly just extra mass we don't need. Also note the engine has to be pressure fed and can only be ignited once. Looking at propellants, we need Ampha 22, this is an alcohol based fuel. Then we have Erfna 3, and I do hope I'm saying these right, which is your oxidizer. And finally, nitrogen, which is used for pressurization. There is more info here, but we have enough to configure our tank, so let's do that. We'll start by bringing down the diameter of the tank to just 300 millimeters, which matches the diameter of the engine. Looking at Kerbal Engineer here, you can see that we have no delta V, and that's because the tank has no propellants in it yet. We need to provide the propellants we just saw in the right ratios, which seems really intimidating, but don't worry, they made it easy for us. First though, note how high pressurized is false. Remember our engine needs pressurized fuel. To change this, open the real fuels tab and change the tank from steel fuselage to high pressure steel fuselage. And we can see now that high pressurized is true. As for putting in propellants, all we have to do is press fill according to the needs of the WAC Corporal Araby and it fills the tanks with the propellants we need in the correct ratios and now we have a delta V. Let's take Kerbal Engineer off compact and note that we have enough fuel to burn for just 14 seconds. Recall this engine is rated for 47 seconds so what we're going to do is increase the length of the tank until our burn time is a few seconds more than this rated burn time. Right, a little more, there we go, 52.3 seconds, I'm happy with that. Now on to avionics. Before we get into getting the shape right, we need to pick what kind of avionics package we want to have. At the start we have only two choices, Near Earth and Science Core. Near Earth provides full control of the craft all the way out to two times geosynchronous orbit. This rocket is going to be unguided, so I'm going to select Science Core, which takes away that control but saves us a lot of mass and electrical demands. Then click switch to start to lock that in. Back at the context menu, change the shape to smooth cone, the top to zero making it a point, the bottom to 300 millimeters matching the diameter of the tank below it, and then I brought the length up to 1.5 meters to give it a similar pointy top to the original. Alright, let's give it some experiments to perform. RP-1 uses Kerbalism for its science processing which allows you to add experiments directly to the avionics package rather than as separate parts. Clicking configure experiments brings up this menu where you have four slots that can hold different experiments. Unfortunately, we only have two experiments at the start, a thermometer and a barometer. Notice that these Kerbalism experiments take time to perform, with the temperature scan taking a full 10 minutes. This rocket is not going to survive that long, which means it'll take multiple launches to collect all the science. The available experiments are listed under the science tab in the parts context menu. Switching them from stopped to waiting will have them turn on automatically as soon as there is science for them to do. Notice that Kerbalism also provides an additional telemetry experiment. Next I opened up the Kerbalism build helper and noted that I have enough electric charge aboard to last for almost 17 hours. The batteries are in the avionics package. 
I change the EC amount to just 100 units, but to affect the change you need to hit apply. You can apply and have the part change size to fit the new configuration, but I hit preserve dimensions because I want to keep the shape the way it is. And once I clicked off the avionics part and back on it again, the Kerbalism helper is now telling me I have 16 minutes of electricity. That seems more appropriate. Okay, this is starting to look like a rocket. All that's left is some tail fins. For that, I grab the B9 procedural wing and put on three of them. These things start off huge, but are highly customizable. To get the edit window, hover over one of the wings and press J. To adjust the sizes, you can pull on the handles, drag the bars that's in the editor, use the buttons beside the bars with either the right or left mouse buttons to move at different amounts, or you can just put in raw numbers. One piece of advice though, other than the offset, don't make any of these numbers zero. Apparently Ferrum Aerospace flips out a bit if you do that. There is a ton to tweak here, so rather than going over each in detail, I'll just cut to what I ended up with for my final settings. There is also a mass strength multiplier that adjusts both the mass and the strength of the part. As this won't be going far, I turned that down to 0.1% for now. We'll see how this performs in simulation, I may tweak it some more later. Now comes the fun part, making it pretty. There is a large collection of different textures as well as a recoloring GUI that provides a ton of customization. But once I was happy, I added a mini milk stool decoupler for this thing to sit on and tilted the rocket a bit towards the east so that it'll crash into the Atlantic rather than Orlando. Now, as we'll see soon, it's going to take months to build this rocket, so you are certainly going to want to test it first. To do that, open the Kerbal Construction Time window and press Simulate. There are things you can tweak here, but if you're just launching from the pad, all you gotta do is hit Simulate and go. And basically, we're just gonna hit the space bar and hope for the best. Off we go. Oh, and we have ourselves right away an engine failure. That's a thing. Thankfully, this is just a simulation, so if I go back into Kerbal Construction Time, there it is, and just restart the simulation, no harm, no foul. Okay, this one certainly seems to be doing better. These simulations are zero risk and don't cost you anything, so simulate to your heart's content. You may have noticed that I used the Kerbal Construction Time menu to restart the simulation, not the stock menu. I worry that reverting with the stock menu may mess up the game. The main thing I'm looking for is that the rocket performs as expected and whether it is in need of any more tweaks. I am getting some temperature gauges on the fins but no explosions so I think the strength setting is good. There's just a tiny bit of fuel left after the engines flamed out so I'm happy with that. I'm also noticing that I'm only using a tiny fraction of the batteries so I think I'll reduce the number of batteries even further. In fact the entire mission lasted just under 4 minutes, not the 16 minutes that the batteries were rated for. Again, don't revert back to the VAB with the stock menu and don't go back to the space center. Instead, use Kerbal Construction Time to end the simulation and revert back to the editor, where the only change I made is to half the stored electric charge. Now it's time to actually build this thing. The first thing you'll want to look at is tooling. Tooling is an upfront cost to invest in specialized tools and machinery to make the construction of the parts cheaper. You can right click on parts and tool them individually, but the easier option is to click the RP1 button and look under the tooling tab. Here I can see the tooling costs of my fuel tank and avionics, what those parts would cost without tooling, and what they'll cost after the tooling is complete. Tooling will bring down the cost of this craft from its current 500 curb bucks to only 60. As I plan on using these parts multiple times, I think tooling will be worth it. So I'll hit tool all and then purchase all toolings. Also, I'm going to need to construct a launch complex in order to start building. This is under the Kerbal Construction Time window where I'll click new LC. There's a bunch of options here to customize the complex, but I'm going to keep it simple and just hit build. Now, if I click Show Hide Management under the Construction tab, I can see my launch complex is scheduled to be completed on January 30th, one month from now. 
I can't do anything with this rocket until the complex is complete, so let's head over to research and development and look at getting something going in the meantime. You do start with two science to spend, and I know eventually I'm going to have to unlock this early science node in order to complete the suborbital research program, so I might as well start working towards that now by beginning research on early tracking systems, which will get me some better biological sample capsules as well as an upgrade to my science core avionics. So I'll start researching, and notice it just says researching here. I don't have this unlocked yet and looking under the research tab of the Kerbal Construction Time window shows that early tracking systems is scheduled to take an infinite amount of time to complete. That's because I have no staff researching this. Under the staff tab, I can see we have 20 applicants looking for work. You can hire them as engineers or as researchers. For now, I hired five researchers, which brought the completion time to June 14th, 1952, about a year and a half from now. Each hire comes with a salary and facility cost, but don't forget we have an annual budget to help us out with that. You can fire these people, which doesn't cost you anything, but they don't go back into the applicant pool, so be aware of that. If I go back to Space Center Management and look under the Combine tab, you can see I have a prop trainer sitting in the hangar. I'll be talking about this little plane in detail next episode. In the meantime, I figured I might as well make use of the building, but in order to get the plane built, I've got to assign it some engineers. So I hired five engineers. Engineers need to be assigned to the right building. In this case, that would be the hangar. And now my prop plane is scheduled to be completed on April the 5th, just four months from now. Again, you'll see the plane in the next episode. For now, let's warp to the completion of our launch complex, which will allow me to start construction of the WAC Corporal. The pop-up here just tells me that I need to spend another five curb bucks to unlock the launch stand, and now I need to assign some engineers to this build. I hired eight more engineers and assigned them to the launch complex, but that had the rocket being completed a few weeks after the plane, so I took one engineer out of the hangar and assigned them to the launch complex. There's no penalty for doing this, and now the WAC Corporal is scheduled to be ready on April the 18th and the prop trainer just a few days later. I then took my last two applicants and hired them as researchers. And with that, there's nothing left but to time warp to the completion of the build. It took a few more days to roll it out to the launch pad, bringing us to this lovely morning of April the 13th. Somehow it finished a few days early. And now there's nothing left but the launch. Well, the engine didn't immediately fail, so that's a positive start. At the top right, we have this very useful window from Kerbalism where you can monitor various aspects of the mission. Right now, I'm monitoring science experiments, and the thing to note is that all three experiments are still waiting to run. RP-1 takes away that easy surface and low atmospheric science, so we're not going to be collecting anything until we crack 40 kilometers and enter the high atmosphere. In the meantime, I have cracked the one kilometer mark satisfying the requirements for the contract. The rest of this mission is gravy. The engine has now ended its burn. Our apoapsis is 44 kilometers, but is decreasing, so we'll just have to see how much time we'll end up spending in the high atmosphere. We'll definitely be landing safely in the Atlantic, though. We are now collecting science. You can see how long it will take to collect all the science that is here it definitely won't all be collected on this mission. If we click on the data tab, you can see that we are transmitting that science back home. Unlike the stock game, there is no penalty for transmitting the data from these experiments instead of recovering. But if I had experiments involving samples, they would have to be recovered and can't be transmitted at all. We'll look at some sampling experiments in a future episode. Under the Info tab, it gives you a running total of the amount of science transmitted, as well as how much electricity is left in the vehicle. We are now below 40 kilometers, so our experiments have shut down. We can also see that there is no more data to transmit. Our antenna was able to transmit the science data as quickly as it was being collected. I also got one reputation for cracking 40 kilometers in altitude, and six more reputation for completing the first launch contract. 
I know there was a lot of information thrown at you in this episode, but I wanted to walk through the initial setup and first build in detail for those that may never have played RP1 before, especially considering that version 2 RP1 has changed a lot of things. I'm hoping that future episodes will be more let's play and less tutorial. As I mentioned, this is all relatively new to me too, so if you have suggestions as to the direction this series should take, let me know in the comments. And if you like what you saw here and want to make sure to keep seeing more, make sure to hit that subscribe button and maybe even the notification bell. And if you really like what you saw, there are links to my Patreon page and YouTube memberships down below this video. But I think, as we are preparing for a destructive splash into the ocean, I'll be drawing this episode to a close. I hope to see you for the next one.